So we're just up here at the square chulpa at Silistani. We just had a good look round it and we found um, a lot of evidence of extreme antiquity and also extreme destruction. So there could have been some kind of cataclysm here many thousands of years ago, or even just a couple of thousand years ago, but it's officially supposed to be Incan chulpa, this one. Although there are Koya Chilpas and possibly um, Bukhara Chilpas as well, these three, three or four different cultures that existed around in this area. But uh, the fact that there's extreme lichen on some of the stones and the fact that there's it's been a huge cataclysm and, and the technique is very similar to Easter Island and you can see the style uh, sequence is like completely in tune with that. So it's a real mystery, Silistani, but we're going to have a good look around and see what else we can find. The sun has revealed a shape just here, though. Yeah. Some, something going on there. Could be some kind of llama. It could just be a protrusion. There's other protrusions along here. It looks like something going on there. A great protrusion knob up there. Definite shape here, something going on here. Just behind me is the famous square chulpa here at Silistani, and you can see behind me also there's some great blocks that have almost been like exploded or pushed away, heading over in that direction. This is really interesting because you can see the mortise and tenon joints, which look just like the ones you find at Stonehenge with the lintels and the uprights. And you do find that in other areas as well, but here it's particularly noticeable. And you find that on the, the round towers and the square tower here. The other thing about this one is that it looks just like um, Vinapu or Vinapu on Easter Island, where the Moai stand on. And you get a very, it's also a very similar type of rock, this sort of uh, volcanic sort of basalt rock, almost tuft like in places. Uh, but there's been obviously some kind of cataclysm here for this to be like this. Um, but all the knobs that are on here are partly the design which we find at other places but some of them are actually mortise and tenon joints so it's hard to know what's what now because it's so badly damaged these particular ones on this block the vanapu style square chulpa look like they're kind of keyboard buttons we find um, at oriente tambo machu picchu and other places whereas these ones look more like mortise and tenon joints although they do look like they do look like some of the knobs you do find around peru as well you can see like the, also you get this effect here where you have this shallow sort of bowl in the rocks and this is often, you have the opposite, like a mortise and tenon, a very sort of low mortise and tenon joint that hold the rocks together. And there you've got, you've got some very interesting features on this rock as well. You just see, well, these are very strange, this could just be very badly weathered. And there we have a couple of other knobs or possibly mortise and tenon joints. This could also be a serpent, uh, some kind of serpent on the side of one of the rocks at the square chulpa. Very interesting. So it does appear that these stones here have come out of the square chulpa over there, which is a good, what, 150 feet away, maybe 200 feet. They've obviously been thrown out of the chulpa in this direction heading towards the end of the uh, peninsula here. How on earth could that have happened? How on earth could such a powerful force have moved these stones so far away from there? So look at the possible theory that what this was was not a tomb originally for some ruler, but it was an acoustic generator. If you look at the shape, it flares out from the bottom to the top, which doesn't make good building sense, but the interior, there is an entrance, and the interior is beehive shape. The stone in the core is called andesite, or diorite, which is very hard and then it's qu quite densely packed in there with white clay which is from another area it's not from this location so if you had a tone or a sound on the on the inside that that sound could have been enhanced by the denseness of the diorite rock 
with to some degree the clay acting as insulation. Then you have an empty or hollow layer and the structure is surrounded by basalt, a different stone, not as dense, and those divots you see in it could, again, have possibly enhanced sound. But for what reason? So what engineers have told us when they look at these is they notice that there is damage mainly to the northwest side of each of these chulpa. Doesn't matter where on this plateau you look, it's always to the northwest side. So the conventional story is that the first Spanish came here and they started taking them apart for building material. But why would you take one side off like that? Um, the engineers believe, or at least some of them believe, that these were actually acoustic generators of some kind. And you have different kinds of stone. The core is a diorite or andesite. It's very dense. If you take two of them and strike them together, they make a sound, a tone, a musical note. The interior is hollow, and it's again, it's in an acoustic beehive kind of shape. So it's possible that somehow there was an energy being generated in the center of it, and going up, the diorite or andesite has been packed in with a white clay from some other part of the country, it's not from here, that that may have acted like some kind of insulator. And then the energy or sound would go through that stone again because of the beehive shape and that's why they were hollow because the sound would then come out through the top. Uh, what's curious is the external stone is always basalt so you always have an andesite or diorite core and then a ba basalt exterior and the tops of, of them, especially this one, you can notice that there's a curve to them which again it looks like the end of a not a flute, but a, of a, a recorder that you play. So the theory is that at some point in time, after they were constructed, there was a massive energetic event that caused these to basically explode, for lack of a, of a better word. But the large square one that's over on the left-hand side, some of those stones have been thrown hundreds of feet away. It's unlikely that they were taken down and rolled, they, they form a line that goes at least 100, if not 200 meters. Yeah, and also all the fill, like the fill you see in the cracks, that's been done recently. That's the unfortunate thing. When they try to restore something, they disregard the fact that this was at one time super tightly fitting together. The sound is enhanced in the interior. So if this tower was tuned to a specific vibration, um, probably a natural vibration, then that sound or that vibration would be enhanced and probably go up the chulpa and I don't know whether the sound or vibra vibration was meant to come out or just be concentrated inside the structure. What we know from local farmers is that all of the buildings they have on their farms are square except where they store seeds and that's a round building and when we asked this old farmer why is this round compared to the square ones? He said, well, because of the, the wind and the, uh, the air here, a round building helps to dry the seed. But then he also said, my grandfather told me that it also energizes the seed for a better crop next year. So they may have simply have been built to enhance seeds for agriculture, which is pragmatic, or possibly um, as well, or for accessing higher conscious levels of the mind. But when they were built, nobody actually knows. They're attributed to the Inca, but the Inca did not build these. So we're just here at the, one of the main round towers at Silistani. And we're at just the right time of year, isn't it? around the winter solstice, around midday. And we can see this wonderful lizard carving on the side of the chulpa on a curved, massive basalt bit of rock, very high up. It's a very large lizard and it's very similar to the ones outside the museum that have been kind of left to rot really. It's the same design, it's kind of flat, but it's 3D, so it's classic relief carving, similar and almost exactly, in fact, to what we find at Gebekli Tepe in ancient Turkey. So there's a lot of similarities we're finding here with the stonework and everything else. So this is really one of, the, one of the key aspects of these sites here in Peru is that you can't help but notice the similarities between here and Gebekli Tepe in Turkey. And even a ledger Hoyak and Hattusa as well that had the polygonal puffy stonework. And so we have to question, was there cross-cultural contact here? 
because there's a high technology, not just in the stonework, but in the acoustics, in the telluric currents, and in the earth energies and the consciousness effects that they were working with, as Brian has been explaining. And so it compels me that there needs to be a proper analysis, maybe an academic analysis, of the connections between these two cultures in Southeast Turkey and uh, Lebanon and the Middle East and here in South America, especially when you consider the Fuente Magna Bowl uh, has Sumerian script on it and Proto-Sumerian mixed with Amara. It's like the uh, Rosetta Stone of the Andes. And so this is just one example of many uh, of the similarities and the connections we find and that is one of the themes of this trip we're on, trying to find the connections between these great ancient cultures. It's very close to the main chulpa here in this area. We find there's evidence that gold was found here in 1971 by archaeologist Arturo Ruiz Estrada. 520 objects were found made of beautiful, perfect gold. And they've been hidden under here, under actually underneath these rocks, probably by the Inca at the time who were controlling the area in the 15 and 1600s. And, um, it's an incredible achievement really because it just proves that there was gold production here probably from the Puno area where the gold came from also silver and lapis lazuli and other precious precious stones so here was a very important site and these are probably you know most likely at some point used as burial chambers by the Koya and the Inca even though they're probably I think built along before then as acoustic technology towers of some sort so there's a lot going on here, a lot of different elements, but the fact they found almost four kilos of gold, which is incredible, and uh, the Spanish never found it. So he hit it well, well done. You can see some high technology stonework here with the carvings and the beautiful elements here with the you know, holes in and the mortise and tenon joints. It almost looks, as Brian explained, they looked like they were two hollows connected together for some acoustic purpose. Whether they use keystone cuts is unknown. We haven't found any keystone cut marks here, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did use metal because they were known to use it all over uh, this part of South America. This tower here, which is one of the so-called Inca towers, you can see a beautiful serpent carving on the top level. Very similar to what we find at Catimbo and other sites around Cusco. This is why I think these have been attributed to the Inca because it's thought the Inca actually built Coricancha and Sacsayhuaman, although it's quite well known now that they didn't, and it was a much earlier culture, and they just discovered it. So I postulate, and many others do, that this brilliant stonework, this amazing carving, is of very high antiquity. So on the steps up to Silistani, we find this beautiful spiral carving with a strange kind of triangle underneath it. I wonder if this represents, quite possibly, some solar movement of the sun throughout the year. This looks like it's in situ on the original steps leading up. Okay, we've got here, uh, cut into the bedrock, a hole which is uh, probably about uh, 14, 15 inches in diameter. Uh, there also seems to be other scoops to the side. This is very similar uh, to the sort of holes that you find at Gobekli Tepe, Karahen Tepe and these early um, you know, proto Neolithic sites in southeast Turkey. Now exactly what they've been used for is, is a mystery. I mean some people speculate that they were used to contain liquid you know or grain or something like this or they might have some kind of symbolic value maybe releasing energy from the earth itself. Um, but some, sometimes when you find them, uh, particularly at Karahan, they're, they're generally always in pairs, suggesting they're almost like eyes looking up at you. But once again, this is yet another link to the culture of Gobekli Tepe. So perhaps that statue could have stood in there. It's possible. It looks almost the right size, doesn't it? Yeah. So Andrew just found another snake on the stone here. It sort of looks like it's got some kind of head on it. And these are kind of the signatures you also see at Tiwanaku, so... It's interesting to see the slightly different carving rather than... What do you think it is? It's like an Egyptian eye like that. Yeah. 
kind of a strange protrusion on this rock, like a weird kind of keyboard button or something. I'm not sure what that is, but that is quite strange and interesting. Could be part of a, another relief carving of some sort. At the top of this tower, we do find some, what looks like some kind of protrusion and some kind of shape there. I'm quite sure it's kind of supposed to be serpents on it, but we can't see them clearly because they could be in the shaded part. And yet another serpent on the second level up of this so-called Inca Chupa. This one's got on a third level up. It seems to have several of these protrusions or knobs sticking out. Not much else really. There's some very strange carvings on it, but not nothing that looks animal-like that we can see from this angle anyway. Let's take a look around it. See what else we can see. On the fourth level there we've got some a protrusion, some keyboard button or knobs or whatever they're called sticking out. Around here on the dark side of the chulpa. Not really too much going on. There's an interesting entrance there, very polygonal blocks making it up. And more protrusions on the side here. These are all in the shade. There is some kind of feature here. I can't really see it in this light. It's all about the light. These are very extreme protrusions, as you can see on the side here, sticking out. This is quite strange. It's like a ramp leading up to a chulpa with this massive block and then a small chulpa in the end. So that looks like it's come off a chulpa. It doesn't look like there's much carving on it. It, doesn't look, it looks slightly rounded, but not particularly. Having just walked around the other side of the chulpa, the one with the great stone, it looks like that great stone is actually this stone here. This is the other side of it. And to me, that looks like it is part of a very large chulpa. You can see this is one of the joints in the stone. So this is the andesite quarry with some megalithomaniacs all over it and you can just see some of the channels cut, the blocks and the protrusions sticking out on them. Absolutely fascinating place, the birthplace of the temple. So we found the andesite quarry. Here's one block that's still embedded in the bedrock. It's got a couple of the protrusions on it. This one as well looks like it's started to be worked. There's various other ones. Most interesting so far, as well as finding holes like this and cuts like that, are these scoop marks, which look like the scoop, not dissimilar to the scoop marks we saw at Machu Picchu and other places. Very interesting. You see the way the channel's been cut here as well. So let's have a close up of this, have a quick look. You've got some sort of cut marks, large cut marks there, and another one there. But it doesn't look like it's been just scooped out. It's really interesting. Other interesting features here. So this has just been scooped out. The channel's cut throughout the bedrock. The basalt was imported. There are no basalt quarries here. Well, Brian just said there's no basalt here. So this is, this is the andesite quarry. So where on earth did the basalt come from? It's all over the quarry here. We do find evidence of cutting out the bedrock. It's fine examples, actually. And we must remember, this is andesite. This is extremely tough stone. Incredibly hard. Here's like a curved piece here. Here's another piece here with a, two protrusions on them still. Very rough, but you can still see them. So maybe this is, as I've suggested before, actually the birthplace of the temple. This is a sacred site in itself. The quarry is like the forgotten stones, the ones left here, imbued with power, but not finished. Here we have some more scoops on the rock. Very interesting little place. Up here we see more protrusions or knobs sticking out of the rock. This is a very large one here. But why is it so rough? And it kind of removes the idea that these knobs 
were actually for moving the rock, but this is on top. I mean, how would that be any use? It wouldn't make any sense. There's the top of these ones here as well. That's had a channel cut right through it there as well, through solid andesite. Incredibly hard rock. You can see it there, all the way through that rock. So this one here has uh, protrusions on both sides of it. One of them is in the shade, the other one's in the light. This is the classic example of one of the stones left in the quarry with the great protrusions sticking out of it. Not much, too, not too much shaping has been done on it, but it's a beautiful piece nonetheless. So the weathering on this looks extreme, makes it look extremely ancient. You have the lichen, you have the extreme weathering on this extremely hard rock, this andesite rock, with these protrusions that look like they've been damaged over thousands of years. This does not look like it's does not look like it's 500 years old. Just at the very end of the peninsula at Silistani, there's a bit of red tufa, which I don't know how on earth that got here, whether it forms naturally in some area nearby, some volcanic area. But this is the same type of rock you find on the Easter Island Moai, on the top knots, on the hats. Fascinating. <laughs> This freestanding monolith is called Huwakasea, and you can see on the side of it, it looks like it's got a serpent relief carving on it. What's interesting is, is that it could be anthropomorphic, it could show a kind of human form. It's been very badly weathered. It's very interesting that this standing stone is here at Silastani. It's sort of out of place, really, with the other with the other parts of the site, but fascinating nonetheless. And they say it's a Pukara style stone, which is very interesting because they were around potentially a couple of thousand years ago. So they were marking their spot there on Phalai, the Axis Mundi, with this sacred temple site of Silastani.